To start off, my name is Lily Jagosinski from Move United, and we want to welcome you to the Basics of Wheelchair Racing Equipment webinar. We're super excited for some special guests today, and we appreciate you taking the time to be here. Fantastic. And um, the next thing that we're going to be talking about, if you haven't already checked out our Move United Adapt at Home page, you can go to www.moveunitedsport.org slash adapt at home. And there you will be seeing a variety of virtual programs that are offered there. We encourage you to tag us on social media at Move United Sport and use the hashtag adapt at home to show how you're moving. All right. And we are, want to introduce our special guest today as well. We have Daniel Romanchuk. He is a 2016 Paralympic athlete. He competed in the track and field events from any, everything from the 100 meter dash to the 5,000 meter distance race. He also is a six time major marathon winner where he won two times in New York City, two times in Chicago, as well as the Boston and London Marathon. And so we appreciate you being on here, Daniel. And we also have Krieg Skabort. I'm sorry if I just said that incorrectly. Um, he participated in the Paralympics as well, six times uh, as a track and field athlete and triathlon athlete for South Africa and the United States. He also won an ESPY or an Excellence in Sport Performance Yearly Award in 2015 in the Male Athlete with a Disability category, and he broke the Ironman world record in 2011. So thank you so much for both being here. We're excited. We know that you have extreme knowledge in this area and appreciate you taking the time to be here. All right, and now what I'm gonna do is turn it over to Kim Romanchuk. Kim is an online science teacher, as well as she happens to be Daniel's mom and manager, and she's going to be moderating the session. So thank you so much, Kim, and uh, we'll let you guys take it away. All right, well, thank you so much for having us. Um, we're just uh, really excited about partnering with Move United on this. Um, first, I wanted to just make a couple of quick notes. Um, uh, both Daniel is a sponsored um, top end Invacare athlete and Krieger is a top end dealer. Um, and so what you're, the kind of equipment that you're gonna be seeing in these um, sessions is, is mainly top end because that's what they have to show. Um, but um, the vast majority, the principles are gonna be applicable to other brands of chairs, um, especially within the United States, um, the Eagle Sports chairs and Carbon Bike that are the other uh, two uh, popular brands of chairs. Um, and so I just wanted to make that, make that note there. Um, so we are, um, Daniel and I have been talking about doing something along these lines for a long time um, because I think it's kind of seared into our memory what those early years were like when we uh, didn't know very much about equipment at all. Uh, Daniel's mechanically inclined, but I'm not. And um, it was always hearing all these, uh, all these terms, Schrader, Presta, Hub, Axle, Compensator, Cylinder, Toe in, Toe out, Alignment. I was just like, it was like a foreign language. Um, uh, but it was really important to, to um, understand. And so that's why um, we wanted to put something together. Um, and we're thrilled to have uh, Krieger with us as well, because uh, he's the real brains and experience behind this operation. But Daniel, um, do you remember some of the things that you felt like as a young racer when you were dealing with this stuff? Uh, a, a little bit, um, uh, mostly confusion, as you mentioned. Um, I remember uh, being at events and uh, being concerned to even pump up my tires uh, because we didn't know if the valve was just going to decide to have a mind of its own uh, and all of the air was just going to leak out um, or if uh, you know we overinflated it and then I would uh, possibly get a flat. Um, which would mean gluing a tire and getting a new tire and uh, just trying to figure out what size, what this, that, the other thing um, is all a lot of confusion. Um, and uh, I've been very, very fortunate to, uh, along my journey, uh, to have people, uh, just, to, just to name a, uh, some of them, uh, Jimmy Cuevas, uh, Barry Ewing, uh, Peter Park, Adam Bleakney, uh, Marty Morse, um, uh, along the way to kind of, uh, you know, 
show me how everything works. Um, and uh, what, you know, most notably, uh, especially at races, um, if I ever had a, a question about equipment, uh, you know, Krieger, you were not hard to find. Uh, you know, there, there would always be a, a group of other racers with uh, their own equipment questions um, all around you. And so how did you get to know so much about uh, equipment and racing? Well, uh, that's a question that comes from long, long ago, uh, Daniel. But first, I just want to thank you guys for um, uh, inviting me to join you on this. This is, this is really a great opportunity. I don't know if, it's, uh, if we should say thanks to COVID-19 or... <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, we are here. We are uh, uh, sharing our experiences. And um, Kim, yes, thank you. And uh, thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Move United Lily. I appreciate it to be... Uh, be here with you guys and share my experiences. But Daniel, yeah, I, I'm totally, I'm totally with you there. I was lost as well when I, I know exactly that feeling, what it's like when you are lost and there's no one to help. I, you know, uh, growing up, uh, mine started a little bit uh, longer ago. Um, if you think of you now the late 1980s, that's when I started world tour racing. So it's a while back. Um, I had a mentor in South Africa, so I'm originally South African. I had a mentor that he helped me in uh, just the basic things of, of uh, wheelchair racing, wheelchairs and parts. So, but for the most part, I think the reason why today um, it's, I, I know a little bit perhaps more than most of the, the other young, young guns out there is uh, experience, you know. I've been in it a long time and I think I didn't have a choice because I had to fiddle with it. You know, I had to fiddle with a, with a part of a racing chair. And I can remember the first time when I got a, a, a racing chair that was, that was made for me, the, just like the little compensator cylinder. I looked at that thing and I couldn't believe it. You know, there's something magic in there. What is it? And I always wanted to open it, but I was so scared of opening it. Because if I open it, I won't be able to close it again. I won't be able to go race. <laughs> so I just left it where it was. Um, but uh, uh, if I can just mention this as well, um, I remember so clearly, uh, my first racing chair was actually a homemade racing chair. So we made it in my town, my first racing chair. And um, on the way to my first marathon, I've never done a marathon. I have never been in this racing chair. We picked up the front part of the racing chair, that was the steering, right? We picked up the steering at the machine shop. And from there, we jumped in the car and we drove, drove 600 miles to get, to get to my destination where I assembled the racing chair there for the first time. I got in it that following morning and the next day I had to do a marathon. And I remember that chair went all over and left, right, left, right. So everyone thought Krieger's never going to finish it. Uh, I did finish it. I got, I'm not going to tell you about my time. I did finish it. It took a heck, heck of a long time, but uh, you know that's how I learned. You know, I I didn't have uh, you know those days. There was no internet. There was no uh, uh, real books or directories to tell you exactly what the parts are for racing chair. Um, so uh, you know, it was the Sports and Spokes. Sports and Spokes was the only magazine of those early years. And uh, I couldn't wait to get that sports and spokes and I would flip through it, you know, there's all my heroes, you know, that one and that one. And uh, I was so scared just, just to think of these guys if I had to be live with them, you know. And later on, I realized, you know, I know, start to know all these guys. Um, but yeah, no, so, um, you know, I, you know, over time, I just got more involved in, in the part. And I think it, it started becoming a, a, a passion for me, you know, to be to know all about the racing chair. Um, and uh, it just took many years. And then since uh, I, I started traveling to the US and I started getting involved in, uh, in so many marathons here and so many track events, especially at track events. Like you said earlier, Daniel, you went to a track event and there you are and you couldn't really figure out this and that and that. So I was there as well at a track event and then, but mostly I just did my own thing. And uh, over time I realized people Come ask me to help me, you know, pump a tire or do this or that for them. Uh, and I was always just too willing to help, I guess. 
uh, and then um, it just evolved, it evolved into more of uh, get, get more involved in, in athletes and, and their needs. And I kind of enjoy it, but I don't really enjoy it to work on an athlete's chair just before a track race. <laughs> uh, because if it doesn't work, it can be my mistake, right? So uh, you got to be uh, take caution there. But, uh, uh, I, you know, if I look at this racing chair here, there's so many new things today on it nowadays on, on the racing chairs and I and I and I think let's let's look at it a little bit you know um, Daniel what what do you think so, so you want to you want to tackle this and just go over the parts for the, of the chair and, and yeah. give us a basic background of, of all the the yep. front to the back yep uh, and so I will be using a um, another camera if the screen is uh, kind of black right now it is labeled equipment view uh, so as I uh, said before to start always safety first um, wear your helmet whenever you're in your chair um, you know whether it's on the road on the track or even on the rollers um, more on that in a uh, another session uh, so we're going to start with the structure what gives the chair its structure and so uh that is pretty much this uh we're going to start with the main beam here uh so this can either be carbon fiber or aluminum mine is carbon fiber um and it goes all the way from the front here past the cage attachment point here, all the way back to the rear axle. Uh, and the length of the beam determines the length of the chair. Uh, moving to the cage here, uh, you can see that mine is bolted on. Uh, that is because I the cage is mostly aluminum and my beam is carbon fiber and uh, it you cannot weld the two together uh, so you have to figure out some way around welding to attach them uh, so the this is bolted on uh, if I were to have just an aluminum chair uh, that would be welded um, but I have a, a carbon fiber hybrid so moving back to the cage uh, there are two fenders one on either side uh, and extending down from the fenders are the side guards this protects the athlete from the rotating wheel uh, on my style of chair i have a kneeling pan here uh, and this is where a lot of my pressure will go, as you can see with all of the torn up padding here. Uh, moving back to where the athlete actually will uh, be sitting, uh, that is actually back here. So this is the seat itself. Uh, so I'll be sitting here, my legs will come forward, my knees will be at the edge of the seat pan here, the kneeling pan, and then my legs will continue down out the back. Um, and to finish out the cage, uh, there is whatever strapping and upholstery uh, that is required for the athlete to be uh, nice and secure in the cage. Uh, moving below the cage down to the axle here, uh, so the one thing to note about the axle is that uh, the axle does not move. Uh, the bearings are in the wheels, um, so the axle itself doesn't move. Uh, but I actually want to, I want to pay attention to this little silver piece right here. Um, so this is called a camber bushing. Uh, it gets its name because it applies a slight tilt to the wheel. Uh, when it's attached to the frame, uh, and we call that tilt camber, uh, thus the name camber bushing. Uh, that tilt provides some stability around corners. Um, 
And uh, another thing that the camber bushing does is that uh, it is actually a separate piece of metal that is clamped in the axle itself. Um, and so if I were to undo this clamp here, I could rotate this freely inside of the axle and that would change something that we call the alignment or the toe of the wheels. Uh, there will be more on that in another session. Um, but the last thing that the camber uh, bushing allows us to do is that it allows us to uh, screw a wheel into the frame. And so I have an axle pin here. And so you would just put that, uh, it allows you to screw an axle pin into the frame and so everything is nice and uh, secure. Of course you wouldn't be using your hands for this. Um, so that brings us to a wheel. Uh, so I'm gonna get my cage out of here or my frame out of here a little bit. And this is a uh, wheel. And so like all wheels, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start from the outside moving in. Uh, and like all wheels, the, uh, it has a tire. And so the tire is the interface between the ground and the rim of the wheel. Uh, the rim itself is this uh, slightly concave uh, little, divot, oops, <laughs> uh, you can see it's slightly concave and that just helps hold the tire um, onto the rim, uh, although it alone is not enough to hold it entirely. That's why you can see a little bit of dried up glue there, uh, more on gluing tires uh, in another session. Uh, but moving in from the rim, you have whatever gives the wheel its structure and uh, keeps it round. Uh, in this case, it is carbon fiber. Uh, but if I were to go to my front wheel here, you can see spokes. Um, and so it's just something to keep the uh, wheel round. And then finally, at the very center here, we have the hub. Uh, and so the hub contains the bearings. So this is a bearing. You can see on uh, the very outside, there's a little silver piece, blue a little bit closer in, and towards the very center, there's another silver piece. So that is basically the outside, middle, and the inside of the bearings. That just allows the axle pin to stay still uh, while the wheel rotates. Um, and on the in the very center, you of course got your axle pin. Um, so I'm gonna kind of demonstrate a little bit. So you can see the wheel is spinning, but the axle pin is able to stay still. Um, and then uh, talking about axle pins, you could see that that one was removable. Uh, but on this other wheel that I have here, this axle pin is fixed. This cannot come in or out. No matter how much I pull on it, uh, it is fixed in there. Uh, there's no distinct advantages or disadvantages to a fixed or movable axle pin. Uh, it's just something that you have to, to keep in uh, mind, especially when traveling um, and uh, things like that. Uh, finishing up with the wheels. Got the other wheel here. Uh, so I've just switched, I'm switching between a few sets of wheels here. Uh, and you can see this piece, this round uh, part. So this is called a hand or push and then ring or rim. Uh, it does not matter to me which two you combine. Um, but it is what the athlete uses to uh, apply power to the rear wheels. Uh, and it can be customized in size 
uh, depending on the athlete, and also uh, the number of attachment points changes depending on the kind of wheel that you have. Uh, and so that's another thing that it can be customized to. That pretty much brings us to steering. Sorry if any of you uh, are getting a little seasick with all of this movement. Um, but uh, just like on a bike, the direction of our front wheel determines the direction that we will go. Uh, and so the front wheel is bolted on either side of the hub to the fork. Um, and so really we use the fork to determine where we will go. Uh, so I'm gonna grab a spare fork here and kind of lay it on top. And you can see this part here. Uh, and so this part on the spare fork is actually inside of the main beam here. The main beam here is hollow. And so this part on the installed fork runs through that hollow point or part and is clamped on the end with the steering tube. Um, and so uh, that is one of the ways that we turn is using the steering tube up here. Uh, but I actually want to concentrate on the other attachment point of the fork. Uh, so there's this little arm here that is uh, attached to all of this down here. Uh, so this whole uh, apparatus is called a, uh, a compensator assembly. It's comprised of two parts uh, for the most part. There is this part here, which I call the cylinder. And then there is this part back here, which is, I call the track control. Um, and uh, going back to the cylinder, uh, you can think of this as sort of a self-centering device. Uh, and so this will keep the wheel at a specific zero that you define, uh, or if you override it with the steering tube, it will bring the wheel back to that zero after you're done uh, steering. Uh, and we actually are able to define our zero by using the track control uh, down back here. And uh, as the name implies, it is used on the track uh, to either set our zero to be on the straightaway or to go around the turn. Uh, and so unlike a bike, we are constantly applying power to the, uh, in this case, non-existent rear wheels. Um, so we can't be constantly uh, steering uh, because we have to apply power. Uh, and we kind of use this track control and uh, cylinder assembly to steer for us for the most part. And as you can kind of see, the track control uh, kind of uh, will, uh, if I move it one way, that is actually my zero for going around the turn of the track. And if I push it the other way, this is my zero for going along the straightaway of the track. Uh, and so, uh, that is basically what the uh, the assembly down here does. It just keeps us going in one direction. Um, but uh, it does have its limitations. And that is where the steering uh, tube comes in. So if I were out on the road and I came up on a 90 degree turn, uh, and say it was too sharp for my uh, track control, to turn around by itself, I can actually override zero by using the steering tube and just pushing on it on either side. Uh, and so you can see when I push on it, that changes the uh, orientation of the fork and uh, thus steering us. And it has a uh, higher range of motion than the uh, the two zeros of the track control. And so it is used for uh, more severe turning. 
Uh, but one thing I want to uh, kind of take note of is that it will always return to the same zero, no matter how hard I turn it, uh, which way I turn it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it will always return back to this one zero. Um, and so once I'm done turning, I just let it go and it uh, returns to that zero and it just keeps me going where I wanna go. Uh, that brings us to the final part of the, uh, the final function of uh, our chairs, which is uh, breaking. Uh, and so that is done by the brake assembly. And uh, it is pretty much uh, comprised of four main parts. There is the brake lever, which is what you uh, uh, compress to um, actually break. There is a cable inside of this housing here that goes all the way up to uh, the assembly here, uh, which this sort of uh, assembly here, it goes uh, on both sides of the rim is called the calipers. And then the final part of it is, uh, I might have to turn on some uh, extra lighting here, actually. Uh, one second, sorry about this. Um, uh, there we go. Um, but you can see uh, this sort of red piece that is uh, on the inside of the caliper here. Um, and so this little red piece is the brake pad. And so this is what actually makes contact with the, uh, the rim of the front wheel. Um, and so how it kind of works is if I depress the uh, brake lever, that will tension the brake cable, uh, moving the calipers and rubbing the brake pads against the rim of the front wheel. Uh, that is a brief overview of uh, the core functions of pretty much all racing chairs. Um, but there are, however, different styles of racing chairs out there. And so for that, I'm actually gonna pass it off to uh, Krieger. Well, Daniel, that was great. That was probably the best overview I've heard. So I think that's your, your new job for a while. Maybe, maybe stop, quit racing and uh, travel around and just to uh, uh, give an overview of racing chairs. <laughs> well done. Um, you were talking about brakes earlier. Um, I, uh, I, I remember so well um, along my first racing chair um, did not have brakes. Now, okay, so if you look at this little racing chair, this chair also, there's no brakes on it, right? There's no brakes on it. So early years, um, this frame was from the 1980s. It's a, it's a Bob Hall. So early years, the guys, uh, what they used was they if they had uh, a sleeve, uh, 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 they either used their gloves, grab the wheels with the gloves, like Home Depot gloves or garden gloves, whatever, or they um, they used their elbows to pinch the wheels. But with elbows, it can be tricky. You, you got it's got to be a cold day basically. Uh, so you have multiple vests or sweater on or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just, I'm trying to think back, how did I get along without using brakes? And uh, now, you know, especially looking at this and listening to you about the brakes again, um, it's kind of, uh, yeah, we did it then. Um, I guess the chairs are so much faster now that uh, we definitely need it. Um, but if you think back, you know, I think uh, wheelchair sports start in the, in the years, early years after World War II. And it was, um, it originated out of England, out of uh, Stoke Mandeville. Stoke Mandeville used to be the main area where they had their events and, and their competitions and so on. So, uh, and of course, those days, um, there was no, you know, high equipment. It was just basically the chair that you get from your hospital. 
that was your baby. You, uh, you went from door to door, room to room in that chair, and you also went on the race check, uh, track in that chair. So uh, uh, my first racing chair actually was my, was my day chair. Believe it or not, yeah, I was in, when I was in the hospital, I, I went from, an, uh, I, I, at this point, at that point, I didn't have a racing chair yet, my homemade racing chair, so I just used my, my everyday chair, and I went for, for, from one little uh, fun run event to the next, and I did, um, you know, many fun runs, like 3Ks and 5Ks, but I always never had someone to race. I just raced other runners. It was the funniest thing, actually. And of course, on a day chair as well, there's no, there's no brakes. You don't, you don't use brakes. So I, I think the, uh, the brakes actually start come in uh, later on after, after from the four wheelers to the, to the three wheelers. But before I get there, um, yeah, this chair, um, you can see this is from the, uh, I, I would say this is the first kind of a pure racing wheelchair that you see there. Uh, before the, these, it was also always mostly a modified day chair almost, where the guys did change the wheels a little bit, they changed the, the bigger front wheels and the bigger uh, hand rims on the, on the wheels, just to be able to push it faster. But this, what you see there, is a very basic, um, but still a lot going on. Um, and I think the great thing of, our, of those chairs was they could actually um, anyone could race could, could sit in that you know it, it could be me as an amputee, or it could be could have been Daniel with his feet down, or it could be uh, anyone. Because those days you you, you didn't sit, sit in these fancy positions like we're sitting today. It was just basically sort of like I'm sitting now, or you sit with your feet down on a on a foot strap. Um, so over time, um, they, you know, when I got my first racing chair, it was a four-wheeler four -wheeler like this. And then over time, they, uh, it slowly evolved to the three-wheelers. And I remember the first three-wheeler that I saw, uh, it was on, um, on, 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 uh, in sports and spokes or something. And everyone said, no, they're going to go back to four-wheelers, uh, three-wheelers not going to last. And today, all chairs are three-wheelers. So it's just a lot better, you know, with a three-wheeler, if you think you have to brake, what wheel are you going to put your brakes on? So now we just have, like Daniel explained, the brake is only on the front wheel. There's no brakes on the back wheel. Um, but, uh, I, you know, even as an amputee, you know, we, we uh, um, well, let me just rephrase here. Let's just go back to this photo. We had the three, or we have, now we have three basic frame styles. And first, you know, is the, like you see here, uh, in front of that chair is like a V by the cage. It's called the V frame. And the second one we have is the U cage, which basically tells you what you see there. You see that U, it's called the U cage or a lot of people will just call it a kneeler, a kneeler a kneeling position. And then the third one is an eye cage. And basically it's what you see there is also in a, in a eye, in, in the circle of an eye, um, the letter I, of course, um, it's an eye frame. Um, but let me just wrap back around to all three and give you an, kind of an idea of, of the function of, of each, model in each style and who's going to use what style and what model what you have to look for when you are looking for a racing chair so let's go let's uh look back to the v frame now the v frame uh, when i started racing it was all the chairs was basically v frames so v frame was for someone that could sit with his feet down or it could be a combination of a horizontal seat um uh, that I could use as an amputee. Um, the only things that, that I, that someone like me had to change is the strapping around my waist or, you know, just things to keep me in the chair. Um, uh, but nowadays, you know, you've got all the different styles. So the V-frame 
uh, mainly is for, for folks that want to put their feet down in a sling or on a solid footrest. So as you can see on that top photo is the V-frame with a, with a footrest, and that is a sling footrest. So you have your feet um, down below you, and, uh, um, and, and suppose, supposedly the, 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 um, the footrest has to keep your feet intact, but we improved with that system nowadays, so it's more of a solid footrest. So the solid footrest, it's, it's, uh, it, it clamps to the frame, and uh, so you can move it up and down. You can either move it up and down, up or down, or backwards and forwards. Um, but another thing about the V-frame, it's it's a quite a versatile chair. You can also sit in um, in almost like a kneeling position in the V-frame. If your knees cannot handle the hard tubing or the hard part of the frame in the UK, you can you can still use a, a V-frame. Um, the tricky part about a V-frame is just to, you know, to get in and out with that V uh, that you see there. So, um, but over time, you know, we, we start seeing um, the U-frame becoming a whole lot more popular. Now, I remember very well, it was in the early 90s, um, I think it was 1991, that uh, Franz Nittlesbach from Switzerland, he was the first guy that actually was in a, a, on a kneeler. Uh, where you your knees would um, be able to bend 180 degrees back towards you. So the kneeler um, uh, is is basically your most aero kind of chair you're gonna get. The frame for your body type, it will hide most of your your extremities away from uh, away from the, the flow of the air. So you sit tucked in in that frame, and uh, and the air can move around you. Um, what is also great about the, the kneeler is is uh, you can get locked into into that tiny little small, small space very well. Um, like Daniel said earlier, he loves his strapping. You know, he's got a good bit of strapping behind his back, keep him down, and uh, a lot of guys use uh, even a strap over their knees as your knee by your knees over the top of your knees or in front of your knees to pull you back into into the frame um yeah so the kneeling position is is definitely the the the, the most popular one but as i said you know you got to be able to bend your knees 180 degrees if you cannot do that you have to go back to the v frame and see if if that works better for you but then sometimes you get guys that, that it doesn't really work too well for them to get in a, a V frame. Their, their legs are too big, you know. They, it's a big guy, and they, 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 there is just not enough space to get into that little V section to get your feet down in there. Um, and that's how the the eye cage actually uh, came along. Um, so the eye cage, you can see on that photo there, there is no restrictions in front of the cage. Uh, it's just lower down where, the, what, where that one bar go from one side to the other. But in front of you, you can just jump right in. It's almost like a day chair, apart from the middle main beam that's, that, that you have to lift your one foot over. But with the, with the eye cage, you can just um, connect a, um, a, a, a footrest, like I mentioned earlier, a solid footrest that clamp on. And uh, voila, then you just have your feet in the footrest and uh, you got everything nice and open. It's easy to get back out of the chair as well. Um, another thing that the eye cage uh, work well for is for amputees. Um, as someone like me, uh, my, my chair is, is, is not totally an eye cage, but it's very, very much like an eye cage. But, uh, you know, the, the, the cool thing about all these racing chairs is... They are they are so custom built, you know. So so you can you can get an eye cage that your manufacturer can can make to your your own specific um, uh, body type that you have. So this is just a basic framework that is available out there for all of us to give us all kind of a, a guideline what we can go for. Um, 
I want to, I, I just want to touch back real quick about Daniel mentioned something earlier about what also evolved into the, the, uh, the frames and the styles and the racing. And uh, you mentioned the helmet, you mentioned the helmet. And I, I had a laugh about this, uh, uh, um, Daniel, when you said, even on my roller, I have a helmet on. But, you know, I've seen guys um, really, I mean, it looks like that roller is going to come off its tracks. So it does make sense to have a, uh, a helmet on your roller. And especially the guys like the guy like uh, Daniel, he's probably going to go 20 to 24, five miles an hour. Uh, and if anything happens and your wheel spin at that speed, you're going to see Daniel and from the next moment he will just be gone off the roller. So uh, helmet um, is, you know, the brakes came in first, then helmet's the last race that, um, was allowed for athletes that could use, uh, could go without the helmets, was the 5,000 meters in Barcelona in 1992. And I was in that race. And we were 15 guys in the final. 15 guys in the final. And uh, 11 of us crashed. And I was one of the 11 that crashed. And the guy that was in front, Heinz, he won the gold. Uh, Marcus Pulse, he was in second. We were all basically together. Marcus Pulse from Germany, he got second. And he stayed in second. And Enzo Marcello from Italy, he was way back. He fell off actually behind us. And he came up on this big crash and he wriggled his way through it. And he went all the way around us. And he came around and he got a branch mill. I'm telling you, I've never seen a face that happy. <laughs> um, um, Marcello was the happiest guy with a mill I've seen in my life. But uh, yeah, that was, that was the story about helmets. And then from there on, it was, there was no more races without helmets. Every, all the races uh, above, I think, yeah, 400 meters had to have helmets on. So, yeah, um, in short, that was uh, my kick about the helmets and uh, the different style frames. So, uh, I don't know where we're going from here. Let's yeah. <laughs> Oh, that was, uh, I love hearing these stories. Every time I talk with you, Krieger, you have a new one. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, really interesting to hear um, the, how, how all these things came to, uh, came to be. So um, we're going to transition into some question and answer time here. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, today's session was uh, meant to be a really basic overview um, of the different parts, just to kind of lay a solid foundation for everybody. And then in the future sessions, uh, we will be doing some more um, specific things, tires uh, is uh, next week, and I believe wheels is the following week. Um, so um, we will deal with specifics at those points, but if you guys have any questions um, that you want to put in the question and answer um, section, that would be helpful um, to help us keep track of them. Um, so let's see here, we've got a few questions. Um, so uh, this is for Daniel. Um, is your cage custom made that is uh, made to measure? Uh, so, yep. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, Krieger might uh, be a, a, li a little bit uh, of a, a safety net. If I miss anything, please let me know. Um, but uh, yes, so um, you can kind of see uh, the, uh, the width uh, from between uh, the fenders, that's a measurement. Um, there, uh, there, yes, it, it is custom made. Um, I, I should probably not try and make uh, too elaborate of a thing about it. <laughs> uh, to answer the question, yes, it is custom made. Um, there are lots of measurements um, that uh, that go into getting it right, uh, and sometimes an even an inch or less than an inch uh, will make the difference uh, between uh, getting a, a chair that really works well for an athlete or uh, something that uh, you know might uh, really not work at all. I remember Daniel, um, you use the same chair because we use program chairs, uh, which were wonderful to have um, because we didn't have to buy them when you started racing at age four. Um, they were old, but they worked. Um, and um, it was, 
Uh, I think you were in the same chair for maybe seven years, uh, but we accomplished that not because you weren't growing during those seven years, but because we used a lot of foam. <laughs> there was a lot of foam that went into that chair um, just to make it tight. Um, so, um, Kriga, that kind of brings us to a question about um, if you're a program or an individual athlete, but I, I really want to focus on a program right now, and um, you want to start having some racing chairs, what are, what are some considerations, um, some things you want to think about when you're ordering them? Good question. Yeah, you know, uh, program chairs are ideal, actually, for if you, if you look at who's going to use it first, okay? So um, hopefully you want to use a racing chair that can be uh, down passed to other racing chairs, but also at the same time and at the, at the same time and at the same time frame used by other athletes. So if someone wants to try it. So um, it is good to have a customable chair, but um, I, I would say, you know, when it comes to program chairs, rather have something that can fit a few athletes rather than just one. You, you know, if you have one athlete that is this tiny little uh, person and um, you have your majority of your athletes like medium size and then one or two bigger guys, I would rather say just stay to that mid-range of, of measurements for an athlete so you don't just get that one tiny little racing chair unless this athlete buys his own racing chair because that racing chair is only going to fit him the tiny tiny guy uh, and instead you can rather use all those foams like you and daniel were talking about you know you add foams until uh, you grow into it and eventually you're going to grow out of it um uh, but also you're going to look into um what what kind of um, disabilities do you have? You know, how able are your athletes? You know, are they amputees, or are they paras, or are they guys that just want to uh, do basketball and do a little bit of racing wheelchair? So you can go to a really entry level chair if you have basketball players or other sport that also just wanna wanna do a little bit of racing for them just to try. Then you get something that's a uh, that's a program chair. For instance, top end as a prelim a preliminator. Uh, that is something to to take notice of. Uh, but then once you get um, you get situated with okay, uh, I want a B frame um, for most of my for my athletes. Then you can go to a dealer, or you can go to top end, or carbon bike, or Eagle Sports. Um, and the, 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 the manufacturers or the, the suppliers in your area and get start getting information and, and uh, also just, you know, hit the internet and see what's out there available and who's in your area that can help you. Yeah, that getting measured is, uh, is, an, important, uh, is an important part of it and getting, getting those measurements right um, yeah. is, uh, is good. Uh, so we have a couple other questions here. Um, uh, is there a typical, Krieger to you, is there a typical rear wheel size um, and can you attach the push rim to any wheel? The, uh, the typical rear wheel size is the 700C, like on my chair here, or that's on, uh, that Daniel uh, is using, and that is the regular size of a bicycle wheel, 700C. Now, some of the athletes do use a, a smaller wheel, which is 650, 650 millimeter. The 700C is uh, uh, 700 milli millimeter. Um, and uh, so those smaller wheels are mainly for juniors or someone with very short arms that cannot reach down to the push rim of the wheel. Now, the rim, the, the, the rim itself that attached to the wheel uh, you cannot you cannot attach any rim to any wheel. Uh, you get your you get your spoke wheels, and then of course you get your desk wheels like this. So most spoke wheels um, uh, have you know depending the amount of spokes that, uh, is on the wheel that dictates if that rim that push rim is going to fit on the wheel. But most most spoke wheels are the same. So you will be able to use a, a spoke rim push rim for a spoke wheel. Uh, for these wheels, um, the, they either has 
have six or five attachment points. Now, whether you have a push on for five or six, that's gonna dictate what wheel you're gonna use. Like these wheels are six, and one of the wheels that Daniel had there, the Kareem has five, and the zip wheel has six as well. So it, it, all, it all depends on, on what kind of wheel you have, but then when you buy wheels, um, you always have to look, uh, um, or it, uh, say for instance, you have 10 push at home, all right? Then see, okay, I have 10 push -ups. Most of them are for a certain kind of wheel. It will help to buy that same kind of wheel again. Otherwise, you're gonna sit with all those push rims, hand rims, and you, you're not gonna be able to use them. Right. Does it make sense? Yep. <laughs> um, Daniel, is the surface of the tire the same across um, the width of the tire? Uh, so that kind of depends uh, on what style of tire that you uh, you have. Um, uh, for some of them, it uh, it, it is um, like on. Um, Yep, on this one, uh, this I uh, use, uh, this one's a Podium TT, um, and if you were to look closely um, at the, uh, the edge of the tire, uh, it is uh, the, the same, it's got the same texture across the, uh, the whole tire. Um, there are other tires uh, that will kind of uh, change their pattern, um, but uh, it all depends on what you get. If I, if I can jump in there, if you, uh, uh, mainly you, on, on our chairs, you have tubular tires. Now a tubular tire has the tube inside the tire. Now all tubular tires are like this, they're round. So they are basically as high as they are wide. But when you get to cleanser tires, a lot of the cleanser tires are not really as high. You get a cleanser tire that's maybe 25 millimeters wide, but it might be a little bit higher than, than 25 millimeters. But uh, yeah, tubular tires, perfectly round, and that's gonna be, you know, any direction, the same measurement. And I'm guessing you guys will go into um, those different styles of tires and that kind of stuff uh, next week um, in, in some detail, hopefully. Um, so um, the next uh, thing, I have a question uh, for Daniel. Um, so I have a young athlete, um, should they, and they're mostly on the track. Uh, you mentioned there's two ways of steering, um, the, the steering, the steering uh, tube and handle and the compensator. What should they be using to steer when they're on the track? Uh, so when they are on the track, um, I, I, I recommend um, oh, when, whenever possible, uh only use the track control uh the the steering tube is really for uh for quick adjustments um and bigger turns uh you know sharper turns i should say um on the road and things like that um but if they're just on the uh on the track um just try and get that compensator dialed in. Uh, I think we'll go over that uh, later in another session. Um, but getting that thing dialed in right uh, so it holds a nice turn um, and then just work with them on hitting it at the right times. Um, and ideally, they won't ever have to touch the, uh, the steering tube. <laughs> Unless somebody yeah. walks in front of them across the track or something, right? <laughs> it, it, it uh, Daniel are the one time on the track that I, I will use my, uh, my steering tube. <laughs> uh, I, I can remember this uh, also uh, very, very clearly, Daniel. In, in uh, 1992, now you mentioned, you know, you only use your track control. 1992, we, uh, we were still allowed to go on the track uh, without a, uh, uh, um, uh, independent steering. So the racing chair only had a track control then. Uh, and uh, it was probably not, not the best way because that's when the chairs got longer and faster. And, and also that was the last year of it because too many crashes because of it, yeah. So the steering is important when you are on the track and yep. you have to quickly have to swerve uh, and then you, 
you know, miss, miss uh, uh, opportunity to crash or whatever. <laughs> I, Daniel, you're probably too young to remember, um, but you, um, in one of your chairs, when you were first starting in it, you couldn't reach the steering. Um, and so you really learned how to use the compensator. And I think that was actually an advantage, not that it was necessarily safe, <laughs> but for practice, um, it was good that you couldn't, you couldn't reach it because you had to use the compensator. You see a lot of young athletes on the track who keep on going back to that, that steering. Um, and sometimes that's because their, their compensator needs to be, um, needs to be adjusted better. Um, but and that's uh, uh, just I, a memory I have of uh, you not being able to reach it till we put extensions on it uh, with PVC pipe. Um, so I think um, one last question here uh, to answer quickly. I'm, uh, somebody will have to tell me exactly how much time we have left, but um, are there a lot of differences in the lengths of the frame, uh, Krieger, from one top athlete to another since you order a lot of frames? Uh, okay, so that, there comes that the question about reaching out and be able to grab the the, um, the steering. I remember seeing young kids. It almost looks like they're gonna they're getting out of the cage to reach the steering. <laughs> so <laughs> the funniest thing actually, but yeah, no, absolutely. The 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 shorter frames like the the bubble you saw earlier. Okay, now those were you know it wasn't a problem for anyone. We all, we all could reach the steering, but then we. Um, uh, we actually start realizing the length of the chair does have, an, have uh, an influence on the stability. The stability and also uh, uh, the smoothness of the chair when it really runs at high speeds. So basically when, when it comes down to the longer the frame, it's more, the, the more stable it is, especially when you come into rough roads and you do a 10K, 5K, you're going to go 45 miles an hour down a, down a hill. And if there's a little bit of a bump and you're in a very tiny short chair, you're going to flip over. So the length of the frame, um, over time, it's, you know, we, I, I would say a, a long chair would be like 76 inches long. And that is the measurement from the front wheel to the back edge of the back wheel is 76 inches long. And that's a long chair. I, I will say someone uh, uh, like a six foot two, six foot four guy with a big frame. Yeah, go for a, go for the long frames. Uh, Daniel and myself, we are on seventy four inch frames, which is two inches shorter, which is a happy medium. Uh, I think a lot of people like that uh, this that length. But if I if I look at a junior, I would say seventy inches or sixty eight inches is probably a good um, a good length of total length of a chair. But yeah, important uh, thing to think of when you order. Um, well, wow! Thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, you guys, for all of uh, all, all of your information. I've learned things already, um, and I think I'm going to put it back to uh, Lily with Move United. Hi, everyone. This is Lily, uh, Daniel, and Craig. Thank you so much for the awesome information. I am really new in that space, and so it was really informative, and I appreciate everything that you guys have said. Um, we just want to thank you guys and we are excited to continue this series with Move United. Uh, we have the next two Thursdays set up uh, at the same time and we will be sending out a follow-up email. The session was recorded and so everyone will get uh, a recording of this and it's going to be up on YouTube. If you want to follow them on social media, you can check them out on Instagram as well as on Facebook too and so you connect directly with them. Uh, and so thank you so much for joining us today, panelists and and we, we've loved having you. Um, before we wrap up, we do just want to put in a survey in a chat function, and we encourage you guys to complete the survey, tell us what you thought about everything, as well as tell us any topics that you want us to focus on for the future. There were so many Q and A's, it was great, and we're gonna try and cover some of those topics in the future. And so that survey link is in the chat function, uh, but you'll also be prompted once we end this webinar to uh, complete that survey too. So thank you, Kim, Daniel, and Krieg for joining us and we look forward to seeing you guys next week when we focus on tires. Thank Bye you. guys. Thank you. All right, thank you.